the last class when we were talking about Smith, we saw that one of the directions in which Smith's study took him is in the direction of income distribution. We saw for instance, Smith was talking about the distribution of national income among landowners, capitalists and workers and also his understanding of how they would spend their income. This understanding carries over into Smith's followers, particularly Ricardo and Malthus, who is not much of a follower of Smith, but who uses basically a lot of Smith's tools. What we are going to do today is to study an interesting debate that took place in the first half of 19th century over whether capitalist system is capable of surviving without going into a crisis of a glut. In Smith itself, you do not find any, any kind of forecast about what would happen to the capitalist system. But the fate of the capitalist system with respect to its capacity to survive or even endure a glut becomes a crucial issue, not so much because it, it was of theoretical significance, there was substantial theory that came out of this debate, but it was primarily an ideological issue. The ideology underlying the debate was whether England should in future entrust its fate in the hands of capitalists or whether the hegemony of landlords and landowners must continue in England. The first half of 19th century all over Europe saw the struggle between landowners and capitalists, because Europe, the whole of Europe was industrializing, booming in this period and at the same time, the landowners felt that the old order was continued continuously and substantially threatened by the growth of capitalism. Simultaneously, there was also the growth of the working class and the growth of the working class movement because one thing that was clearly visible about at least the first phase of capitalism up to 19, 1830s was that the working class was very badly off in the early phase of industrialization of not just England, but the rest of Europe too. So, this was a period of not very subtle class struggle all over Europe. But specifically in our case, you see its manifestations in England and France. In England, you find gradually the liberals and the Whigs who were a bit to the left of center or better still center as opposed to the Tories who were right. Now, there is an alliance between the liberals and Whigs during this period. Towards the end of this period, a certain section of the liberals break off into a very aggressive working class movement called the Chartist movement. The Chartists were essentially working class and they demanded specific legislation to protect labor and to protect the interests of labor both as constituents of the nation and the economy and also as people whose incomes had to be protected. So, towards the end of this period, the working class 
in England which is breaking away from the liberals becomes the chartists and in the late 1840s the English political confusion ends when the chartists submit their petition to the parliament which is one way of reconciling the disputes. In France of course, you had the revolution in 1843 essentially again involving the working class, the landowners and the capitalists, but in France it ended in what is known as a bloodbath of the proletariat in 1843, there was virtual massacre of the working class. It is in this framework of ideological moves and counter moves that you find the theory and the debate surrounding the theory of Ricardo being preeminent in the first half of the 19th century. Just before Ricardo, we find Jean Baptiste Say, the Frenchman who enunciates a very rigorous form of Smithian economics. If you remember, we pointed out that there were three offshoots of Smithian economics. One, the offshoot which leads to income distribution, economic growth and so forth, which is the direction in which Ricardo Malthus debate took it. The other we saw was the equilibrium economics, concerned with the long run equilibrium of the market mechanism itself and in this we found that the initiative was taken by not just Jean Baptiste de Say, but also Bentham and in the second half of 19th century Leon Walras and then a little after that Jevons. So, this direction of refinement of equilibrium economics of Smith took place simultaneously with the development of the distribution economics, growth economics of Smith in the hands of Smith I mean in the hands of Ricardo Malthus and so forth. What Say had enunciated was a very powerful hypothesis which was accepted as a law by economists then and later. He enunciated the hypothesis that given uninterrupted functioning of the invisible hand, which means the functioning of the market mechanism without intervention by the state, it was not possible for anything to go wrong. It was not possible for there to be any sustained disequilibrium in the mechanism in the long run. More importantly, Say argued that there can never be any general overproduction in the economy. By which is meant that it is not just an invisible hand, but it is an invisible hand that ensures continuity and stability in the market mechanism. It is in the context of what Say was articulating that Ricardo's writings become significant too. So, let us look at what Ricardo had to say. Now, in 1816, after a prolonged political maneuvering, the landowners of England, the landowners of England managed to lobby and push and bring into existence the corn laws. The corn laws came into existence because due to the Napoleonic wars, there was food shortage in England and there was an inflation. Interestingly, in this inflation, you had the prices of food and wages rising faster than the price of manufacture, which meant basically that 
the price of food rising, there was a fear that people would not have money to spend on manufacture. So, there was a fear that food based inflation itself would be sufficient reason to constitute a threat to manufacturing industries. Along with it, with the rise of wages, again constituting a threat to capitalism and to the market mechanism via rising costs. There was a feeling that the English economy after the Napoleonic Wars might go into some kind of decline, inflation induced decline. So, the corn laws come into existence in 1816 and the purpose of these laws is to protect British agriculture, particularly British corn by means of a truly prohibitive tariff. So, much so that imported corn which was cheaper than English corn before the tariff became prohibitively expensive, it became impossible to import any corn at all. Now, immediately Ricardo started his battle against the corn laws. A substantial part of his economic theory evolved around his continuous rhetoric and continuous writing against corn laws. At the same time, Malthus felt that not merely was corn law good for England, but it was also good for English landowners and therefore, was good for the workers too. What was the issue in corn laws? The issue was as I said fundamentally ideological is our, do our corn laws going to have a deleterious effect on the development of industrial capitalism in England and therefore, should they be repealed? This was Ricardo's position that they should be. Malthus's position was that they need not be repealed because it was not doing any harm to capitalism. On the other hand, it encouraged landowners who spent money and therefore, created effective demand for English industry to grow. This was the position. So, the theory around this evolves around a theory of rent this theory of rent is today attributed to Ricardo it is called Ricardian theory of rent. Actually a year before the corn laws were passed in 1815, Malthus, Torrens and Ricardo wrote on the subject, but it was Malthus, West and Torrens who actually enunciated the theory of rent. And when Ricardo writes about the theory of rent, he acknowledges Malthus to be the propounder, first propounder of this theory. At the heart of the debate and the heart of Ricardian economics is this theory of rent. What does it mean? It simply means that as you go on cultivating land, first you can cultivate superior land, good quality land then you go into slightly inferior land, second quality land and so on and so forth. And as you do this, the output of the land declines. Why should the output of land decline? First, the quality of land itself is inferior as you move on, but equally even if the quality of land was uniform. In short, if you were cultivating the same amount of land, same unit of land 
again and again and again intensively Ricardo argued and so did Mathis and company argued that you will still see successive doses of labor as it is applied to land we will see declining returns to the labor. This was the first time the law of diminishing returns gets propounded. So, as you keep using labor over and over and over again on land intensively the marginal product of labor declines. Now, if you have if you can visualize a productivity curve which swings downwards to the right, then a part of that output of labor must go for the upkeep of labor. A part of the output must go to the capitalist and to the landowner. So, how does the split occur between the landowner and capitalist? First and foremost, in almost a physiocratic style, you find that agriculture generates a surplus going into the hands of landowners and manufacturers, which is what happened in the case of physiocrat. So, in almost a physiocratic style, this is happening again in the Ricardian system. However, in the Ricardian system, the manufacturers are not lay class sterile they are not the sterile class, they are active productive class, they are the entrepreneurs in rural areas as well. So, of the remaining of the residue of the output from land after the wages are taken away, how much should go to the profits, how much should go to the rent for landlords. And Ricardo says profits are determined by the performance of capital across different fields of investment. In other words, it visualizes a kind of a competitive market in which profits for entrepreneurial activity are determined. So, there is an equilibrium, sorry. Uh, under the system, uh, is there a distinction between the capitalist and the entrepreneur, or is the capitalist and the entrepreneur the same person? Lovely, there was not a distinction all most of the capitalists were entrepreneurs too in those days you did not have uh, corporate capitalism which came much later. Uh, uh, because I, I thought Shumpita was one of the first theorists who distinguished the capitalist from the entrepreneur. Uh, Shumpita was one of the first theorists who distinguished the capitalist from the entrepreneur. Yes true, true, but the inspiration for Shumpita's distinction of capitalist from entrepreneur actually came from Marx. So, Whatever at this point in time, Ricardo did not make an a distinction between entrepreneurs and capitalists, but good question though. Yeah, he did not make a distinction, uh, it came after 1840s. But as far as Ricardo was concerned, there were the capitalists, there were the landowners, and workers. So, we have workers getting their wages, which we shall shortly see how they are determined, but they get wages which takes away one part of the output. The remaining part of the output has to be split between the capitalist profit and the landowner's rent. Capitalist profit is determined in some equilibrium value across different areas of participation by capitalists in manufacturing, agriculture, and so forth. So that's given by the the market. Profit at any point of time is thrown up by the market. So you have wages taken away from the output profit taken away from the output what is left is rent. So, rent in Ricardo's reckoning is a differential surplus, is a residue. In other words, you take away wages 
from the output, you take profits away from the output, what remains is the rent. So, if you have very fertile land, it yields a lot of rent. If you have not very fertile land, it does not yield much, much rent because there is not that much surplus left over. Right? Now, this is very crucial. This is very crucial. At this point in time, we must just note this and come back to it slightly later. It is crucial that Ricardo looked at rent as a differential surplus, which means it is not something which is like profit determined by market or is like wages determined by market. It is a surplus, it is a bonus for the landowners. In at later times, the debate came up when the price of Indian, the price of English corn was estimated by various economists to either defend or oppose the corn laws. Almost everybody else including Malthus argued that English corn included the rent paid to the landowners of England. They argued that agriculture in England is very expensive because the English landowners rent also has to go into the price of corn. Ricardo straight away said this is nonsense. Rent is not part of the price, rent is, is not part of the estimation of cost of production. Rent is a surplus, wages is part of the cost, profit is part of the cost and what remains is rent and therefore, it is a surplus. So, it cannot be a part of the price of the product because the price of the product is this exchange value determined by demand and supply. So, rent is not a part of the estimate of cost and therefore, it is not part of the price. Now, this was big because then whether English prices were high or low, whether English corn was competitive or not competitive depended upon how you estimate the price whether it includes rent or not. So, in Ricardo was very clear rent is a differential surplus it is not a part of the price. Now, why are wages constant? Wages are constant according to Ricardo because market wages tend towards what he calls natural wages. Wages paid at any one point of time might be rising or falling depending upon specific market conditions at that time in that place. However, in the long run according to Ricardo, wages tend towards what he calls natural wage. And what is this natural wage? It is a natural wage which is determined partly by movement of population and partly by demand for labor. What happens is when population grows, it might not be supported by existing wage rate. And as Malthus says, then there is a drastic reduction in population, which brings up the wages again. And then, as due to pressure of demand, wages rise again beyond that point, then profligacy of working class leads to a decline in wages. There is a difference in the argument here which we must point out between Smith and people who came later. If you remember, Smith argued that laborers, workers were profligate. He even argued that workers might be indulging in absenteeism. So, that when wages go beyond a certain point which is subsistence level, Workers might simply think I have earned enough, I do not need to work anymore. So, that might lead to absenteeism. 
whereas in, in uh, Ricardo who uses Malthus's theory of population and wages and so forth, it is not the short term absenteeism of workers which is the issue, it is the long term movement of population which either leaves the economy with a surplus population that is more laborers than you need in which case there are drastic happenings in the population due to which wages fall, I am sorry due to which population falls and wage rises or due to short run movements in demand which cause the wages to rise which in turn causes population to rise and therefore once again wages to fall. So, it is a highly demographically determined theory of wages. In the long run therefore, the natural wages would be a subsistence wage determined at that level by long run population movements and conditions of demand in the labor market. So, he assumes a kind of a subsistence wage as a long run natural wage. So, granted that you come back to cultivation, wages are determined spontaneously by natural wage level. So, whether there is more cultivation or less cultivation laborers will continue to get the equivalent of subsistence wage. So, you have the bottom line which is subsistence wage and you have the maximum possible output which is possible given by productivity of labor somewhere in the middle between maximum possible productivity and subsistence wage is a zone which is taken by profit and that profit is determined by the market for capital. Okay. Now, so what happens when corn laws come in? When Avantika did you have something to say? Okay. When corn laws come in into the situation English corn becomes costlier, imported corn cannot be imported anymore for the simple reason that it is prohibitively expensive due to tariff. So, English corn prices rise and what does Ricardo see in this? Ricardo sees the share of rent in national income will start rising because when price of corn increases, who, whom does it go to? It does not go to workers the increase in price does not go to the capitalist because their profits are determined by some equilibrium. So, who gets it? The surplus goes to differential surplus which is the rent. So, the land owning class is the sole beneficiary of the corn law. So, corn laws have a substantial income distribution effect. On the one hand, wages are unaffected. So, whether national income rises or falls, that share of wages is more or less constant in that determined by the population of workers and subsistence wage. And profits remain more or less as determined by equilibrium in the market for investment capital. So, any increment in price that increment benefits the class which makes the rent. So, according to Ricardo income distribution shifts in favor of the landowners the moment corn laws come in. So, why should income distribution not favor the landowners? There is no question of whether it should or should not, but what happens when landowners are favored by this new income distribution is that it immediately hits at the performance of capital. How does it do that? On the one hand, the share of capital does not rise. 
So, landowners virtually spend all their additional income on consumption, they, they are not investors, they are just consumers. Workers consume all their income, wage income. The capitalists, their share is declining in the national income, which means their ability to accumulate capital over time is affected. So, as the share of profits declines as a part of the national income, the possibility of capital formation is threatened. And as that happens, as that happens, if the rate of capital formation is slowed down in the economy, it means it is possible that sufficient income is not generated and the economy might start slowing down. So, where does overproduction come into this? After all, you remember we were talking about gluts. Hmm? Ricardo argues that capitalist consumption is not rising very rapidly because they are mainly saving capital accumulating people. But if the share of workers falls in the national income because the rising share of rent, then gradually the ability of workers to purchase sufficient quantities to cover what is produced in the economy is affected. In other words, gradually aggregate demand starts declining. With the decline of aggregate demand, what is left is a glut. So, Ricardo thinks that there is a possibility of glut in the economy, if there are corn loss in the economy. This is a very different position to what we saw in Say's law. In Say's law, there was a mention only of the long run tendency of the economy. It was not the outcome of any particular governmental intervention in the system. So, when Ricardo says that corn laws bring about the possibility of overproduction in the economy, it is not a refutation of Say's law. In fact, Ricardo never tried to refute Say's law, but Ricardo was arguing against a policy in favor of an alternative policy. So, Say's arguments and Ricardo's arguments are two different qualities of arguments that you must remember. But the case was made by Ricardo against corn laws and a very strong case strongly supported by the industrial, industrial capitalist lobby in the English parliament. This contest goes on till the repeal of corn laws in 1846. In 1846, the corn laws get repealed, which means the capitalists in England get a reprieve. They can breathe fresh. And it could be considerably safely considered that Ricardo had triumphed in his war against corn laws. But what was Malthus's argument? Why did Malthus not support Ricardo? In fact, why were his arguments opposed to Ricardo's arguments? It is surprising because Malthus and Ricardo had very many commonalities in their economics. The place where they differed was where Ricardo felt that the rate of profit in the economy would be declining due to falling rate of accumulation because of corn laws. Malthus argued that the opposite is to be expected. When corn laws come in, according to Malthus, there is already an increased consumption by landowners because income distribution shifts in their favor 
So, that is encouraging to the market. More importantly, if the working class consumption declines, Malthus says the consumption of unproductive workers increases. Now, I would like you to look back, reflect on Smith and tell me what is the distinction between productive and unproductive laborers. What is the difference between productive and unproductive labor in Smithian system? Anybody? Prasoon? Krishna? You were not around, so it was fine. Anyone else? You were not around too, so it is fine. You were around. Oh, absenteeism, backward bending supply curve, no that is not it. You remember Smith distinguished between workers who worked in manufacturing and workers who worked as servants of landowners. All employees in the rural areas who were employed by landowners were unproductive according to Smith because they were not contributing any value addition to the income. The workers on the farms contributed value. The landowners had the surplus rent and they paid wages to their servants and their laborers and their way their servants made a living out of that, but they were unproductive in the sense that they were not adding value as opposed to workers who worked on the farms, workers who worked on the factories in the factories and so forth. So, this is the distinction Malthus picks on this distinction and says, so what if productive workers share of national income declines, but with the growth in the share of rent in national income, there will be more unproductive workers employed by the rentier class, by the landowners. And therefore, the additional spending by unproductive workers will more than compensate for the falling spending of productive workers. You want me to say this again? The case we are the seeing here is Malthus's case for corn loss. And what does he see coming out of corn loss? He says corn loss actually are going to increase the rate of profit in the economy. Which one? Okay, so you, you remember Ricardo said that corn laws are not good because they lead to fall in the rate of profit in the economy and therefore they lead to slowing down of the economy and so on and so overproduction, all that sort of stuff. Malthus said corn laws by expanding the consumption of the landed class is actually creating additional demand which in turn will push the demand for manufactured goods and other goods by the capitalists should actually push up the rate of profit for the capitalists because the market is good for them. Yeah? So, this is Malthus's argument and Malthus was saying in detail of this he says okay of the three components of national income the share of capitalists maybe does not increase okay share of productive workers does not increase remains constant because the wage fund virtually is constant but what is happening is as the share of rent increases in national income they are able to employ more unproductive workers by which he means the employment of servants of various types by landowners in rural areas increases. 
and therefore the income generated by these people in rural areas also increases. So Malthus says this additional income by unproductive worker employed by landowner will more than compensate for the fall of effective demand from the productive working class. Therefore, Malthus is optimistic about the, the outcome of corn laws. He is optimistic about the outcome even to the extent of saying that it is good to have an income distribution shifting in favor of landowners away from capitalists. So, this was the fundamental distinction between Malthus and The political effect of this was very clear. Ricardo was continuously backed by the capitalists and all the landowners were backing Malthus. So, it was a clear divide based on very similar economic theoretical position, based on very similar reasoning, but in two different directions. In 1846, with the repeal of corn laws, a lot of this declines. The debate goes into sleep because what happens in England is that the theory of Smith, I am sorry, the theory of Ricardo is proven to be successful. Most importantly, the hegemony of landowners in English politics comes to an end to be replaced by the hegemony of the Eng English capitalists. So, you find that the corn laws were fundamentally. So, in 1846, corn laws get repealed and the hegemony of capitalists replaces the hegemony of landowners in English politics. Ricardo, however, while being an advocate of capitalism in English politics, was a lot more than advocate of capitalism. He believed as a true student of Smith that free trade is the source for efficiency globally of all the economies in the world. So, not only was it good that English landowners did not get away with the goodies, it was not only good that the English capitalists came into prominence it was a lot more important for him that the case for free trade had been made successfully. So, let us look briefly at Ricardo's theory of trade. Before I look at Ricardo's theory of trade, I will take a little diversion to demonstrate how powerful and how deep the effect was in the development of economics as a discipline of the theory of diminishing returns. If you remember the heart of the problem of falling output was diminishing returns to labor, doses of labor. In other words, productivity of labor declined through continuous use. So, fundamental relationship here was established between productivity and cost, right. In other words, you have a rising cost function because you have a falling productivity function. is not this the heart of the microeconomics which you study today. If you look at the theory of the firm, short run cost curves are rising because in the short run productivities are falling. Long run cost curves are rising because long run productivities are falling. 
So, the close link between costs and productivities, which you see at the very heart of economic theory, begins with Ricardo's enunciation of diminishing productivity of labor in agriculture. This is one. The second thing which I would like to emphasize is to Yeah, the second thing I would like to emphasize is how deep the argument went on the falling rate of profit. The idea of falling rate of profit was not significantly emphasized by Ricardo as a fundamental theoretical proposition basically because he was only making a case against corn laws. So, he said you take corn laws off everything is fine. Whereas, the fundamental pessimism of Ricardo about the rate of profits to fall was taken up much much more seriously by Karl Marx and it became a very central part of Marxian economics the tendency of rates of profits in capitalism to fall. So, we will take that up when we are looking at Marx, but once again I am trying to link up. Finally, finally the whole idea of equilibrium in the market economy again rests very much on the laws of return. Look at the theory of the firm what is the cost curve shape of the cost curve in the long run? Short run cost curves are u shaped, what about long run cost curves? I do not know Avantika. In the long run the cost curves are flatter because it takes longer. But are they are they u shaped or not? They might be saucepan, but still you know, might not be. Pardon me. Yeah, it's an envelope of short run cover cost curves, but is it a U or not? It's a U. So even in the long run, cost costs must rise. Right? Long run costs must rise. If not, what would happen if the long run cost curves are downward sloping? What would happen to the equilibrium? It would become indeterminate because demand curves are sloping downwards, supply curves also slope downwards. You know how sometimes you might have an absolutely indeterminate system result in the market. Market might not solve for equilibrium values, equilibrium quantities. So, that is how important that is how important the idea of downward sloping uh, I am sorry U shaped long run cost curves is and the only reason modern economics permits or allows this U shaped long run cost curve even if a flat one is because in the long run managerial costs are rising. So, manager returns to managerial activity are declining. So, once again some kind of diminishing returns lies at the heart of rising costs or not at least not falling costs. So, see how far Ricardian idea of diminishing returns goes in time in economics. So, I was make making these diversions so that we could understand the implication of these ideas in time in the development of the subject. Break for now.